Welcome back to another Q&A. This is part seven. I got more questions that I want to answer. And there's gonna be a part eight and a part nine for sure. So many questions I wanna to get to. So let's start. And as always, uh, you see here, I got my little screen here that tells me the, the room. I can blend with anyway. You know, you know the drill, right? All right. <clears throat> and as always, I'm gonna read out the questions out loud for those who are just listening to this. First question by Philip Filipov. <clears throat> Filipov? I hope I can. As always, I apologize for any butchering of names. I'm gonna do my best to pronounce these as best as I can. Hi, Jean-Denis. First, I would like to thank you for the great videos you are creating. You're very welcome. I have learned a lot from them. That's awesome. My question might have been asked before, but I haven't seen it answered. I decided to make a career change at the age of 37. Is it too late to go into the industry at that age? And does that puts me does that put me at a huge disadvantage when looking for my first job? Looking forward to the next video. Well, that's always an interesting question. Um, I would say my answer is I hope not. <laughs> I don't think so. To be honest, I don't think so. But at the same time, I mean, there are some things that come with it, right? So if you're young, let's say you're young and single. That means that you can potentially stay up late, you can work late, you can also switch companies, you can switch countries. There's a lot more freedom that comes with it if you're young and you have less responsibilities. Now, if you're older, potentially you might have family. Maybe, maybe not, but you might have. So you might wanna spend more time, not more time, but a good balance time at home versus work. You're also not able to travel and change. I mean, the thing is, if a company requires someone to be very flexible, maybe they have to go places, maybe for your job, you know, they gotta be on set if you're later on the animation supervisor, like, I don't know. Like, I think there might be some complications as you get older, but also for yourself, you might not wanna, you might not want to do the same as a younger animator, let's put it this way. But generally, is it too late to start? I would say no. I mean, you can start at 37 and just kick ASS and be fantastic. And then your career is going to take off. I mean, it really all depends on how good you are. Um, I think the, the, I would say limitations, but the potential problems are going to be for you like in terms of at that age, you might have certain constraints or expectations or just you have a certain, you know, rhythm and lifestyle that you don't want to change too much or can't change. So I think it's more that that could be a potential problem, but it's not really that they won't hire you just because, you know, you're 37 or 40 or by the time you're done with your schooling. I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't think so, but you know, there are always some potential problems depending on the person and, and their country or whatever it is, right? So I can't give you a, a definite yes or no. Wow, that's a long one here. ED Ventures. I have an important question. There are various people like me who enter into the animation industry lately as they realize that life is about following their passion. They enter late in, into the industry so they can't afford a four-year bachelor's program in arts or related designing fields. A very similar question. There are various people out there who say that a strong base is required for this field, which comes from a strong degree in the designing field that makes people like me upset and demotivated. That sucks. Can you make a video on what is really required to get into the field of animation and what extra education can a person get to reach the topmost studios and get the most out of their brain along with their creative abilities? I always end up searching on Google whether I need a bachelor's degree or not, and it's damn depressing and irritating because I feel that the studio won't treat me equally if I lack a great educational background. I can write a, that's not true. I, I highly, highly um, don't think so, <laughs> but it would be horrible if they do, but I have thoughts about all of this, right? I know most of the people feel exactly like me because I can see various questions on Quora about the same, but they always end up in two groups where some people will say that no, it's all about the experience, and some will say that you need to have a degree and a strong educational background. So I want an unbiased, I'm totally biased, real answer for this question from a professional like you with an amazing experience in the industry. You're way too gushing. I mean, I'm just, I'm following along in this, in this industry, you know, the best I can. Um, so my answer is going to be from that very limited perspective of my experience. That being said, you can have a fantastic degree, right? Best schools, multiple degrees. But if your reel is horrible, no one's going to hire you. And if they do, then I don't know. Then I don't know what kind of company that is. I mean, if they hire you as an animator and you just can't animate, if you got top degrees, then I'm not sure what use. I don't know. I don't know why they would. So my again, subjective thought of that is that, or about that, is that 
ultimately it is, and it's not even your experience. I mean, yes, if you've worked a couple of companies and you want to switch companies, of course, the experience comes into play. But so you, you've gone through a project from beginning to the end, you have dealt with deadlines and people in production, potentially clients, all that is extremely helpful. That's why they sometimes on job postings, they say, you know, one, two, three experience, years of experience needed. Um, so, you, so you can't discount that. But in terms of, do you need a degree? My answer is always, if you're a foreigner, at least for me, again, this is my perspective, coming from Switzerland to the States, um, I needed a degree, either bachelor's or a master's, to apply for my, my work visa. That was just a requirement. Maybe in the country that you want to work at, um, they don't have the requirements. I don't know. So again, this is very sub uh, subjective. Sub sub subjective. So for me, I needed that degree. That's why I went to a school here. Also back then, Mentor and iAnimate and Adam School, none of those schools existed. So it was kind of the only thing I could do. But the degree was important to me because of that requirement, because of the work visa. But ultimately, I got hired because of the real. It wasn't, so where did you go to school? It was more like, oh, you are a foreigner. Oh, you need a visa. Yeah, we can do this. We can do something potentially. I mean, again, thanks, Alan, for doing that. So for me, it's no. My answer is no, you don't need a great educational background if your reel is awesome. Obviously, the more educational background you have will only be beneficial to you. If that's something that, you know, it's the thing is people, some people need school. They just need a curriculum. They need a general education. It, it can only help them expand their field of, you know, just the appreciation of the arts and all that good stuff. And some people might just not need that at all. They just want a very specific, I want to learn animation, that's it. I want to be awesome at that. And they can go through that, you know, path and then have a great reel and get hired. So again, it's very subjective. Um, I don't see why a studio would not hire you because of uh, the lack of education. When it comes to, to animation specifically, again, I can't speak about other disciplines or other companies or other jobs. You know, for some jobs, I'm sure education is a is a requirement for something. In terms of animation, it really is your reel. Like you're really, oh, that's cool. I want to hire this person. And then it's your interview. And then it's about you as a person from a, from a you know, like a social point of view and a personal point of view. Will you mesh with this team? But that's kind of it. So that's kind of my long somewhat answer i don't i hope it's helpful but again to me education is because of potential visa issues or requirements uh, and then ultimately it's your real now if you if you want to go to school for more experience and more training and that's something that you can afford and you can do why not and if you can't or don't want to then you don't have to there are a ton of ways to learn animation outside of a, a brick and mortar school Paco Elson, Paco Elson, Paco Elson, I don't know, it seems like one name. <laughs> Which workflow do you usually follow for your animations? Um, well, my answer now is that it's the shot that dictates my workflow. My general workflow is that I key the whole character. This is very rough, right? But the whole character every four frames and then kind of move my the, the keys in the timeline for the general timing, right? And I, I, I set keys with poses that kind of tell the stories where you have a very a big anticipation pose, a contraction, maybe a full extension, a jump, like all the clear poses. And then I move around the ticks in the timeline in Maya to adjust the posing so that it's clear and the timing is right. And then I go layered. So I use the root and then the chest and then the head and arms and legs, depending on what the shot needs. That's kind of my general approach. That being said, if I do something at home, um, you know, like that, that pigeon, um, I'm walking here, that pigeon shot, that was all straight ahead, which I never really do. But that was a shot, the first shot especially, was all straight ahead. It's almost improvised. So that's because that was the type of shot where I thought I could explore this and try this. Now at work, we have live action plates. We have a very set length of like the shot length. So with something like this, I go more pose to pose where I go, well, I need this pose here. I need this pose here. I need this pose at the end. These are the storytelling poses I need to, I need to tell or show. How do I arrange my timing now to make this fit within that shot length and that limitation? Um, and that's just, you know, potentially with one character. So if you have two characters fighting, then it depends, well, how long do they fight? Do I do one character first, punch the other character? Or are they wrestling and tumbling? Well, then I might have to constrain them and look at that setup. Maybe it's too complex and I'm gonna start with just spheres and kind of move around and simplify the scene to give me a, a better overview. So to me at this point, it's again, that general workflow that I just mentioned, but ultimately it's kind of the shot that dictates, like a, a, a mocap shot is different than a keyframe shot versus a keyframe creature versus a keyframe human. Um, again, the, the type of shot is going to um, dictate my workflow. Lenin Garcia. 
I'm saying these in a specific accent. I, again, apologize. What kind of practice you do in your free time? Do you animate or analyze a movie? Um, I don't animate in my free time, but I want to and I should. Um, it all comes down to time. I spend a lot of time at work um, and I still really, really love teaching. Now, if I would not teach, I would probably animate more at home. Because I also, you know, I, I love work, but it's always a specific type of work. And I would like to do something else at home just to kind of practice different things and keep my animation muscles, you know, you know practice on train that stuff. Um, but it then comes just down to time. So do I practice animation free time? No, but I'm trying to, there are many things I need to figure out with my computer and the specs, it's old and the schedule, but I, that's one of the reasons why I like my, my YouTube uploads because it, it's a self-imposed deadline. So one of the things I want to do, which I haven't done yet for many reasons, but it's coming hopefully very, very soon uh, for my animation buffet is to do walk cycles of rigs. So I can test the rigs, but it gives me a deadline. So it's maybe, maybe once a month, maybe less, maybe more. Uh, and that's kind of like a, that self-imposed deadline of, of animating constantly. So I want to do this with cycles. I want to do this with quick tests, but I don't want to fold that into animation buffet that I can upload on my on my site. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out some ways to force myself to animate at home and practice. Um, but again, there's work, there's family or family and work. Um, I just don't have too much time. Now, when it comes to analyzing a movie, I do that a lot. I mean, clearly I got my uh, um, animation or acting analysis that I post either TV shows or, or movies. A, because I love movies. And it's also something I can do with my wife and kid uh, or friends. I go to a theater. I mean, there's, it's easier for me to watch a movie and sit down and relax and watch a movie than to sit down and animate. Because then it's kind of isolated. Uh, I got to also watch out, you know, I'm getting older. So my fingers, elbows, necks, and my back, like I got to watch out physically. I'm not constantly in front of the screen. Um, so many reasons to, uh, to favor right now analyzing movies versus um, animating. But again, I want to find a good, a good balance. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what kind of practice? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of in terms of practicing. Yeah, analyze movies. Um, I mean, the thing is, I am online a lot. If you follow me on Twitter, you can see all my retweets. I just really like seeing other people's work, um, reading other people's workflow or seeing people's demos or, you know, like looking at other animation channels. I just, I just like ingesting all that information that gives me a different kind of education. And uh, I just like to be exposed to that. Um, I don't know if that's called practice, but I mean, these are kind of the things that I do that are animation related. Elena Felici, Felici Felici. Amazing, thanks you for this acting analysis. You're very welcome. I don't remember what this was for, which one it was. Uh, it must be Chernobyl. I love the show and the second I saw on YouTube that you uploaded an essay on Chernobyl, there you go. I went straight to watching it. I have a question. It's not really about the show or this video in particular. It's more about polishing and using references when polishing. Do you do that? Yes, I do. Because until now I have been taught to use the references just at the beginning stage when blocking the shot and then putting them aside not to get too caught up into rotoscoping or making your animation too realistic and not believable. Watching your acting analysis, I realized though that to add some small details like the protagonist, like the protagonist talking at the phone, you might actually need to look at a very well acted reference. It's not something that, for example, I would do when shooting references. Being an animator myself, I don't really have those acting skills. So how do you deal with adding those small details? Do you feel as an animator where to put them or do you use a specific reference? Sorry for the long question, don't be sorry. I'm a bit struggling with this at the moment. I'm currently polishing an acting shot and I feel like to step up the level, there is something that I still need to understand. Those are great questions. And my answer to all of that is yes, meaning, I shoot reference at the beginning. Again, not always, but I shoot reference for sure at the beginning, just because even if I don't use it, it gives me, like it forces me to try new things. I kind of feel out how the body moves. It gives me a bit of a more reference point of like, you know, weight shifts and just, um, this is a general of what the character could do. <clears throat> but it also helps me if I do shoot and, and look at it, the mechanics, how does my body move? Um, I also do multiple takes so that I don't get used to one or I'm too stiff. Like I like to just, loosen up and a lot of times I use the takes are in between the loop or if I listen to lip sync like, bit to, like before the, the new loop starts I kind of just try gestures it's a bit more natural um, I do use that that being said I have used reference and shot reference where it's just the body and then it's just the face uh, just eyes specifically or just fingers or sometimes you're halfway into a shot or you're again you're polishing like mm, I really need those finer details on fingers or eyes or just head moves and I would absolutely go back and shoot reference so I'm not in the school of thought of 
true reference at the beginning and that's it. To me, this reference is not, it's not something I want to copy unless you have to, unless it's like some creature moment and the client or whoever wants to do exactly what's in that clip and you might end up just rotoscoping the whole thing. Even then, it's not like a magic button. Rotoscoping is not easy. It still needs a lot of work, but usually you still have to put an extra layer on top of that thing. It's just seeing things in real life is one way, but you copy that into CG, it sometimes just doesn't work. You gotta still add that extra thing, still exaggerate despite being photo real. Um, but when it comes to cartoony stuff, you definitely don't want a rotoscope. It's a totally different style. But that being said, I'm not, again, I'm not in the in the school of thought of using it once and then that's it. It's for me, it's it's reference and it's help throughout the things where if I don't understand a move or I need more, um, you know, inspiration for an acting moment or whatever it is, like I use this continuously until the very end. Um, or, and he's asked, do you feel as anime where to put them, um, speaking of the details, I, I, again, I don't always use reference. So sometimes you just have to kind of feel your way through a shot. You have to kind of make it up um and pretend things and just you know come up in your head with this could be a move and and somehow base all of that on either reference you shot or reference you found online so that the basis is you know based on some reality or some creature that exists in real life if you're doing something you know fantasy like um so it's not always reference so yes yeah, sometimes you just kind of have to feel your way through those details and just kind of pretend um, but I definitely use reference throughout the whole process. It doesn't have to be just at the very beginning. Or it's the opposite where I just I just think about it, I don't know, thumbnail, but kind of plan it in my head, animate it, and at the very end, like, hmm, I really need some really detail, you know, reference for my polish. And then I only shoot reference at the very end for a very specific uh, grab or a look or eye dart. So I don't know, my usage of reference is really uh, all over the place. Whatever helps the shot. Mary Quintero. Quintero. Quintero? Do you think it's necessary a private school to begin in the animation world? No. I'm a graphic designer, pretty old actually, 26. That's not old, how dare you? But I want to take the risk to study animation. It costs a lot and I've been saving for a while, but I really want your opinion. Um, so again, it's one of those questions where my opinion is very subjective and I'm not going to tell you what to do because I don't know you. I don't know where you live. Uh, you know, I don't know your financial situation. I know nothing about you besides a name which might even be made up. <laughs> so my answer is always, um, A, you're not old at 26. And no, you don't have to go to private school. You can do any kind of education. Again, I went to the Academy Bar because I knew nothing about anything. Like animation, VFX, art, nothing. So I wanted that general education just for myself. But again, I needed a bachelor's to apply for my work visa to work here in the States. So I had many reasons for that. At the same time, you might not need any of this, right? So you could do private school, maybe, but it's not needed. You can also just do animation mentor or, or any of the other animation schools or you take my workshops or you, know, you want to do something where it's not a full school curriculum but you want feedback over a specific you know amount of time with gaps and it's cheaper um so you can do that i mean you can do all kinds of things i know i don't think it's necessary um it might even not be what you want at all maybe the 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 rigidity rigidity of a school setup and curriculum is maybe just you hate that um it could also be really expensive um and at 26 i mean you got options I mean, I started pretty late too, if that's considered late. Um, so no, that is my uh, opinion. Uh, and there's a ton of stuff for free online. I mean, my channel always is free. There are many, many animation people online who do a ton of lectures and demos. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can get for free. Um, so yeah, uh, to me, no. And you got many options to to uh, to train and practice without spending a lot of money. Good dream. As an animator, what would you consider a successful career? It's interesting. If you asked me that 15 years ago, the answer would be different. I think now, because I'm older, to me, what is successful? That's such a subjective question. Um, it's going to be very cliche, but for me, a successful career is being happy. It's very broad. It might be a very cliche answer, but. Like when I started out, I wanted to work, like I want to work at specific companies, right? That was one of the goals. So that for me was success. Oh, I, I made it into a bigger company, which again is very subjective and is not needed. You might not like it at a big company. You might prefer smaller companies. You have a lot more freedom at smaller companies, right? So already that is very subjective. But that was one of the things that I wanted to work at a bigger company and want to work on those big movies. And that to me was like, for me, it was success. Oh, I made it. 
But once you're in it, like, well, I want to work on, you know, specific projects. So then that was the goal. But then as you worked on those projects, you work with specific people. So then my, my success was, oh, I want to work with those people. I want to be with them. I want to learn from them. I want to be around them because they're fun. So that to me was a different aspect of success. Then once you have that, like, well, now I want to expand my, my skills and my knowledge. I want to do something new. I want to, I would like to be a lead. Um, and now I'd like to be a supervisor. Like, I have different stages of career goals and you know you may or may not achieve them and then may or may not be successful but the older i get in terms of family you know like you got your family life you got work life and pro projects it comes more like in my and not to say content as in you just kind of given up and you're just kind of happy with whatever you have it's just there's a certain feeling of of happiness in terms of i have this job and i'm very aware that i'm lucky to have this job and and it's a difficult landscape out there nowadays. It's like, to me, that is already success. I have a job, I do what I love. Um, I'm happy with my family. I got way too many toys, as you can see, I'm massively spoiled. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't see how you cannot consider this a success. I mean, to me, this is successful, I'm happy. Now, within that bubble, that very subjective bubble, yes, of course, I have different aspirations that sometimes I'm frustrated that I didn't get yet, or uh, I feel like, man, um, I don't have time to do this and I need to learn more to get there. And it's, you know, there's always, I have, oh, there's always a goal. Um, and to me, at least that's important to have always a five, 10 year plan. You have, you know, long-term goals and you're gonna try to reach them. But I, I know, it, I have already achieved my success which is again, my subjective thing. I loved Star Wars. I wanted to work on a Star Wars movie, which I've done. And then now everything else is just kind of a, it's a gravy train. You mean like, if, I don't know, again, it's very subjective, but that's that's kind of how I see it. I go through phase where, oh man, I wish I could do this. I wish I could be on this movie. And then I have phase where like, man, I've, I've achieved what I wanted. I mean, I could quit right now and I would be, and I would be happy. Like I've done, I've done it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. But again, this fluctuates depending on, on you know, your some of the dreams and goals you have and stuff that happens. So, what would you consider a successful career? It really depends on 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 your own definition of success. This is a really non-answer, <laughs> but that's my that's my honest answer to that. My uh, my thought of success and career is going to be totally different. Ultimately, I think whatever makes you happy. Again, this is very general, but. Like it doesn't matter what job you have. If you do something that where you're excited to get up and do your job, like that to me is a success. And it doesn't have to be animation, obviously. It could be whatever job you have. So to me, I mean, I wake up and I'm pumped uh, to go to work and, and, and to animate an X-Wing. I mean, spoiler, there's an X-Wing in this movie. I mean, I open Maya and I have Star Wars vehicles there. And then, you know, I, I'm happy. <laughs> what can I say? Um, that, But that is my subjective view. It's a very long answer to a very short question there and i hope i answered it somehow <clears throat> Ooh. three questions abdul fahim hi i have three questions first after blocking stage when you hit spline your animation sometimes i read this in a very weird way after blocking stage when you hit spline your animation sometimes there is wobbling in shots and eula filter is not helping and you don't know which control is causing that how do you find that cause and how do you solve it that's a great question actually i went through that with a student last semester just couldn't figure out where that stuff comes from um, well, save your scene <laughs> so you can you can futz around with it and you don't break anything. But usually I just start deleting animation from controllers. It's like, hmm, could be, could be this, delete. Oh wait, that bump is still there. Delete this, the bump is still there. And I just try to delete everything until I find that moment. If you can't visually identify the bump or, or the wiggles, right? You look at your control in the graph editor, if, it's, if you see your, your curves, uh, I mean, that's one way to see it. If you don't find it, I start just deleting um, animation from all kinds of controls until I hit this thing. Um, and it can just kind of revert back to the, the scene you, you save and then you know where to where to fix things. It's a good question though. Um, and that's why I'd be very careful in terms of like animation layers or multiple nodes or constraints or whatever your, your extra setup on top of a rig is. Uh, you might get lost into things like this where you got wobble and weird stuff happening. You don't know where that come from or came from. <clears throat> Second, so in most of your videos, you have talked about two things. The most one is taking and finding the reference and another one is animation should not be uh, references. So why is that? What if you want something specific like a cartoon takes or something you cannot do in real life or you like that choice in animation or something you want to add into your animation you like, is that wrong? Why animation should not be a reference for animation? Okay, I think I understand what you mean. Um, 
So what I'm taking out of this is that you should use reference, but you should not you should use live action reference, but you should not use animation reference. Now, I mean, it's subjective and this is something that I've been told, but as I've gone through things, I kind of agree. The thing is, if you're looking at animation for reference, that specific move or performance has gone through the whole process of looking at reference, analyzing it, distilling the essence, doing a caricature on top of that and stylizing it. Like that's that's that animator's take on this. So if you do this, it's just to me a replica is like a copy of a copy where I prefer to look at something that's real, but then take the essence of that. Like, oh, I did something real, but this would never work in the cartoony world. But I like the idea behind this and the intent behind that move. Let me take this and, and exaggerate and emphasize that moment. Um, so if you just look at animation, all the things you're going to look at and learn and potentially copy, it's just going to be more of the same. So then you, the performances are going to be the same. It's nothing new. Um, and that's why I would say look at reference, real life reference for something new. Like you create your own reference, you act it out, or you have your buddy that does that for you just to, to find something new and original. I hope that answers that question. Third, so what should we look for in reference mechanics, timing or everything? When I try to copy on reference, it looks stiff. And when I add something to reference and my animation does not match. Well, thanks for your awesome content. You're very welcome. Um, your animation does not have to match reference. I want to immediately throw that out there. Again, I use reference, it's very subjective, but I use reference as reference, I want to refer to that. I don't want to copy it unless I really have to, depending on the style. But you might start with something, and usually my reference, every time I use reference, it's really very rare that I end up, like the end animation is exactly what I shot reference-wise. Again, unless it's very specifically needed. But so many times, it's like 80% goes out the window. I just take a certain moment, a head turn, a look, a blink, and then I work on top of that, and then the end result is totally different, again, depending on the style. So right off the bat, your animation does not match and probably should not match depending on the style. Um, and what do I look for? Timing or everything, everything. I mean, I shoot reference with timing in mind, or I shoot reference as posing in mind, or mechanics of mind, if I hold something, or prop. So I look at everything depending on, well, that's not saying, I, I look at what I need to look at and I shoot reference in terms of what I what I need to see in terms of reference. So if you're very comfortable with a head turn, uh, then you might not need to shoot reference. You know what I mean? Like you don't, have to, you don't have to shoot reference all the time. And if you're okay with blinks and eye darts, then, then you need no reference. But if you need that for help, then I, I would shoot reference specifically for the things you need, not just, well, people tell me I need to shoot reference and I'm gonna shoot reference and now what? I look at everything that like you shoot, you shoot the things that you need to study. If that makes sense, right? And again, your animation does not have to match it. James, Jam 3D, huh, français, huh, Jam 3D, Jamie 3D could also be that, that info. Do you think, do you think, do you think that the age of a candidate trying to be an animator after spending half life as an engineer can be a problem? I'm talking about 40. So it's like a third age related question. Um, again, no, I don't think, I don't think it should be a problem, but it could be a problem. It's just hard to answer. Um, it could be a problem for you. I mean, you might have problems with what the company expects of people. I don't know in what ways. I don't know. Maybe the schedule is too, it's too harsh. There's too much to do. Uh, there's too much crunch and you just can't do that at your age. You get tired and you have family obligations. So... Um, I think it's possible you can switch, you can do something else, you can be an animator at 40, it just all depends if that lifestyle and at, at that company and at that, in that country, whatever, works with you. It's very, very subjective. I think it can work. Um, and of course, I'm not going to say there are zero problems. I'm sure there's a problem somewhere with someone, but generally, I would say it really depends on you. And generally, I would hope that the company would not judge you based on your age. And technically, in some places, it's illegal to to deny someone a job based on age. I mean, again, it depends uh, on where you live and, and what the standards are there. Elfire, Elfire, Elfire. Hey, what is the best way to develop a good instinct for creating fluid motion in an animation? This is specifically for the movement of a character. I've seen plenty of animated work where the character's movements look incredibly artificial, which makes it difficult to really get into the story behind the animations. Good question uh the best way to develop a good instinct for creating well i mean with good instinct i mean experience uh being exposed to that type of movement and just you know, having 
seeing that a lot and doing that type of work over and over and over will help you in, in developing into i mean you have to develop experience um you have to have experience by also doing that work and making your animation fluid uh and the fluidity could be through through reference copying things checking your curves like whatever you know whatever fluid is i mean there are different ways of you need to be super clean movement or like i don't know again, again depends on the style um but for specifically for a character You've seen animated work where the character's movements look incredibly artificial. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough to say too. You know, like you might have a character that's that's artificial in nature. It could be a fantasy creature, a robot or something. And there's just, uh, there's no real life counterpart where the artist can go, oh yeah, I know what this is. Uh, I can make, I can compare this to something and oh, I, I get this, it makes sense. You might have something that just looks weird to begin with. Um, and then you might also get notes from someone where the notes are weird and maybe, you know, someone is being driven not driven, but you know, you get kind of the the feedback to make it look that way. So when you say that sometimes movements look incredibly artificial, there are many reasons for that. And, uh, and, and sometimes you might be animating something and you have found no reference. You don't know what to do. The people behind the project don't know what to do. And you just kind of make it up and hope it works. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. I mean, it's not, it's not easy. Um, so I don't know if that answers anything, but the best way to develop a good instinct uh, be exposed to the type of movement you want to do, work on the things that, that you know, that will necessitate that look at the end. Um, it, it all comes from exposure and experience and practice and doing things over and over, if that makes sense. Timothy Henning, what are the best animation exercises to master to go from good to great? That's a great question. Because um, usually I focus on how do you just get started? There's a bouncing ball, and there's a box lift, and there's you know, all that good stuff. But what do you do to go from good to great? That's a good question. I think it would be something where you, you choose a piece of exercises that will challenge you in terms of thinking outside the box. You have to kind of also be honest with yourself in terms of, if I do this, have I done this before? Uh, am I comfortable? And, you know, it's not going to be a big deal. But maybe... Once you have that thought, then push yourself. So maybe from good to great would be, you know, maybe shorten your shots so you can really spend time on this, but then really, really focus on the polish, on extra contact points on fingers or weight or squash on, on the feet or just like you want to focus on those type of details that give you the extra detail in terms of the mechanics and the weight and the properties of something where something is hard or squishy. Um, and then also forcing yourself to kind of rethink acting choices. It's beyond mechanics. So you go into the performance where you just don't go with your first five ideas, but you just keep practicing and keep shooting takes and keep looking at the things where, how can I go beyond that? And in terms of animation exercise, it's a hard one because you are, you're past the exercise of mechanics where you have to practice pops and arcs and all that stuff. So for me, good to great. Then it becomes, to me, that's more an idea stage, right? Where it's, you can be good and you can, I mean, you can still be, you know, great in terms of polish, but then the shot is still only good. I think it, there comes a point where once you're done with your mechanical learning, again, spacing arcs and pops and all that good stuff, to be great, to me, the greatness comes from the idea behind it, the acting choice, um, that's the different, you know, the little texture of timing that makes it just extra special. Um, it's a hard thing to answer. Um, so I guess my honest answer is I don't know the best animation. I don't have a very specific exercise except studying actors around you, if that's what you're going for, for uh, performances. Um, and if you're looking just at animation exercise in terms of mechanic stuff, um, it would just, A, look, finding things where you go, this is great. And then studying that great material, be it animation or uh, performance or whatever it is that you want to emulate or, or you know, that you aspire to. A, I would look at that, like what makes, what do you consider to be great? And then look at that and study that. Frame through it, look at frame by frame, what are you doing in terms of mechanics? What are the acting choices there? And then you can always extrapolate that and make your own exercises based on that. Other than that, generally I would find exercises where they push you, again, think outside the box. So if you do, if you've done a ton of people standing, well then we do your same shot, but now the character gets up and walks and then stops, right? You can, you can add, you can add complexity so it's not, it doesn't mean that complexity makes it great, but that complexity will force you to, to practice more and just dive more into difficult mechanics. So for me, again, the different types of great. Great would be that because of those more complicated exercises, you have more practice and training in figuring out mechanics and, and problem solving and just the polish aspect. But this might be the more, I won't say the hidden 
great aspect. It's more just it's just better animation from a technical point of view. Um, and then the second part would be the great thing is that um, look at again inspiration in terms of performance or just good animation that you see outline uh, online or wherever you can, where it's more about the idea and the concept of the work. But I don't have specific exercises for that in terms of like what are good ideas. Um, Again, you would have to look at outside work and let's get feedback. You know, like you can you can't really do any of that in the bubble. So to me, getting great ideas, like if I had great ideas on my own, like I would write a book on this and you know make millions of them. But to me, the ideas that end up being great, to me, at least in my experience, are always part of a of a, a feedback loop. So you show something, be it in dailies or your friends, and then you get feedback, you iterate on that, more feedback. It's a constant back and forth. So to me. I don't know if this is helpful at all, but these are kind of my, my jumbled thoughts on, on that. Uh, I wish I had exercises, like specific exercises to go from good to great, but I don't. My my off the cuff answer after half an hour of me rambling would be take take whatever exercise you've done if they're mechanical and just add an extra layer of character to it, where it just there might just be an extra emotion or a physical state to something where someone's tired or or, or angry or. Um, you know, like something, put that on top of things and then and then redo your animation with that. And if you, you know, and if you can, and it's very hard to do, but just get into the head of your character and, and think about what would this character do? What would be an honest acting choice? But how would this character honestly react within that environment to what's going on out there? Um, but again, if I had like a, a list of exercises to be, like, this, is, this is what you have to do to be great. Um, I don't. I'm somewhat stumped. That's a great question. And I, I'm going to, how about this? I'm going to think about this for a long time. And I want to, that would be a great thing to record and really research and have a great list of, if you do this, this, and this, it might help you become great. Uh, I'm sure there's no surefire list there, but it's a good question. I would love to open this up to the comments, um, given my non-answer. But I like this. So Timothy... I'm going to keep thinking about this. This is going to ruminate in my brain. And I want to come up with some good exercises that are beyond, you know, the beginner to good, but from good to great. Anyway, it's like a 10 minute ramble with nothing. Thanks, Timothy. Oh, is that the last one? Ah, oh, that is the last one for now. Well, what a way to end this Q&A. A Q&A with a non-answer. We should just be silent here for 10 minutes and think about this. What should we do? But I love this. I love this question because it would be very helpful to have a good list of, well, if you do this, this is going to push you and, you know, and at least push you in terms of the mechanics, push you in terms of the the, uh, the acting choices. Um, so yeah, I'm going to ruminate that. Maybe what I say was helpful. Maybe, I don't know. I Maybe if you're seeing this, respond. Like you, can, you can reply and let me know in the comments. Um, yeah, that was food for thought or no, it's useless. <laughs> it's a useless answer. How dare you waste my time with this? Uh, but that is it, right? Yes. So there are at least two more parts coming, got lots more questions, um, but for now that's it. What is this? 10 minutes is probably gonna be like a 40 minute, maybe a bit more clip. Um, so yeah, that's it from me, another round of Q and A's. Uh, as always, any questions? This is the clip with the comments to ask those questions. I will compile them and save them and I will keep answering those questions. Um, if you have questions, maybe go back through the older Q and A's. Maybe I've answered your question there already, but even if you haven't looked through these, I mean, I will post these up. Some questions are always worth asking multiple times because not everybody watches everything. This might be the first time they hear this question. So I'm always kind of re-grab some older questions if someone asks the same question before because it's always worth answering some very bigger question that everybody has. Um, I'm still, as I'm saying all this, I'm still thinking about this last question. It's like, this would be so good to have a really definite list. So Timothy, you're a champ for putting this into my brain. I'm not going to sleep all night. I need to figure this out. But anyway, uh, that is it. I will see you in my next Q&A. The usual, like and subscribe if you want to. Subscribe, hit that bell button, all that good stuff. You know whole, the whole thing, the YouTube thing. But you know how this works. You don't have to like, you don't have to subscribe. You have to do nothing. But if you have any questions though, I do would like uh, comments. So then I can help you with something that hasn't been answered yet. But that's it. Enough of a ramble. It's a long clip. I will see you in my next Q&A. Or if you watch any other clips, I will see you there. Thanks.